people can change anything they want to. And that means everything in the world. Show me any country and there'll be people in it. It's time to take the humanity back into the center of the ring and follow that for a time. You know, think on that. Without people, you're nothing. Without people, you're nothing. Stoke the fire. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between, welcome to episode 48. I believe this one is Stoke the Fire. As always, Jesse Leach and Matt Stocks joining you from across the pond. Um, as I told you on the phone a moment ago, Jesse, I've got <laughs> quite severe ear blockage at the moment. So if I shout and I don't know I'm shouting, just kind of tell me to, to tone it down. <laughs> it reminds me of that Ron Burgundy uh skit where he's can't control, can't control the volume of my voice i just feel like ozzy just walk hello everyone <laughs> rolling around the place but um <laughs> are you doing good you're about to head off on a six-week tour so i imagine your world is just in complete chaos at the moment you're just trying to tie up all the loose ends before heading off i know exactly what that feeling is and uh yeah it's a lot isn't it it's a mixed bag it's mostly awesome and hope-filled and crazy and fun but uh, i've been real busy and just trying to like soak in those last moments of home, all the little things that I cherish, I'm going to miss, you know, because I'm a sentimental fool. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm in good spirits, man. Keeping busy, getting ready to do this. Finally, after two years of being on, uh, you know, hold for this tour, we're finally going to get out there and do it again. So fingers crossed, man. Well, if you're watching or listening to this from America, uh, obviously go see Kill Switch Engage, August Burns Red, and Light the Torch. It's going to be a, a, a historic tour, two years in the ma- well, a lifetime in the making, really. Yeah, mm-hmm. Two years on pause. And um, yeah, tickets are, are on sale now. So go to wherever you buy tickets on the internet. And speaking of tickets on the internet, we just announced our very first live Stoke the Fire event, ladies yes. and gentlemen. Uh, Sunday, the 3rd of April, New York City. Uh, East Berlin is the venue. My first time in New York. I can't believe I get to visit New York for the first time and perform a show in that yes. weekend. And it is the neighborhood uh, that CBs used to be in, CBGBs. So you're, we're literally going to be in the the belly of where all punk rock, punk rock history, New York City hardcore history was born. So I'll have to do a little bit of a tour uh, with you when we get there, too. I'm sure it's going to be amazing. I can't wait. And we're finally putting our money where our mouth is. We weren't just talking shit. We're actually going to be doing live events. Uh, And this will be the first one. And obviously, with my touring schedule, I'll have to figure that out. But we're going to do more of this. This is something I think this is just the first step in the right direction for what we want to do with this. Yeah, I think the first one really is just to kind of assess the demand and make sure that it's there. So um, if you love this show... And I know there's only one location, but if you do want to come and support the show, New York City, April the 3rd is where we'll be. And then if we decide after that, oh, there is a hunger for these live events as much as there is for the, you know, the podcast, then we will do more. So it's all down to you, ladies and gentlemen. Tickets are on sale now. They're $15 till the end of January. And then after that, they go up to 20, uh, which, you know, is a fair price, a a very fair price, I'd say, for what you're going to get, which we will tell you about maybe on the next episode. Um, But for now, let's get our guest. Let's get this week's guest on the show. Um, We, I can't even remember how I came across this guy's work. So maybe he can tell me, Uh, but his name is Rene Lecure. I think that's how it's correctly pronounced. Again, here he is. He can give us the scoop. So Rene, let me kind of backtrack here. Did I hear about you through Chuck Treese? Would that have been how it happened? Does that make sense to you? So it's funny because I was just, well, we had that little two week break, all of us, when we tried to have the Zoom meeting, didn't work. Da, 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 da. So that gave me two weeks to stalk you guys on, nice. on Instagram. <laughs> I know, I know You've done your homework you. as well. Yeah, Love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was like, how did these guys, how did, I was like, I don't even know. I know that I know that I was following you and probably through Chuck. But I was just into your posts, and it was your Willie Nelson posts, actually. A huge Willie Nelson. All right on. Willie Nelson changed my life at 10 years old. But that's a story for another time. And then I was like, how did they find me? And then I was thinking, I must be pretty cool. If these guys just cut. But now it's, it was through Chuck Trees, who's an amazing human being. Yeah, um, I'm sure it must have been God through Chuck him. and, and the skateboarding. Was. The skateboarding connection. Um, it was. I saw your name, and then I remember I was following you, and I'm like, oh, he's doing such cool stuff. 
he seems to have impeccable taste in music. <laughs> I want to be his friend and I started following him. Well, but here I, we are. Here we are connected by the wonderful medium of Zoom. And um, yeah, Jesse and I read your email, read your story, have seen the documentary. Jesse. And um, we're both thrilled to get to know you. So, Jesse, should we take it back to the start like we like to do here on the show? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what what better place to start than the beginning? You know, I got to say, I watched the documentary. I, I really want to get into that, but I think it is only right to, to start because it sounds like you had a very interesting childhood. Um, and from what I read, I, I, I'm sure you got stories, man. I can't imagine. So being off on your own, riding trains, where do you start? Where does this all start? <laughs> Start well, first. Let me uh, first. I want to thank you guys. I'm so impressed with both of you. You both have your hands in so many different things. Jesse, the music kills, and that's coming from a music snob, <laughs> <laughs> probably much like Matt. I'm, I'm guessing, but I am a music snob, and I'll tell you that I think I know everything about every genre. Um, and <laughs> I can relate that. What, what, what are you drinking tonight? What am I drinking tonight? Yeah. Um, where is it? Here we go. Are you on, are you on the tea? I'm on the lemon and ginger. Good for you, dude. I'm going to give the brand a shout out because they're incredible. Pucker. Pucker Good tea. For you, bro. Chin, Good chin. for you. I went through this. Let me ask. So before you guys start interviewing me, let me ask you a question. So because I know you just stopped drinking and just from, of course, like I said, from stalking you on Instagram, <laughs> I saw it seemed like. You stopped drinking, and all of a sudden, there was like this surge of things that you were doing, um, hosting events, the book, blah, blah, blah. Now, my question is, I stopped drinking 20 years ago. I drink now occasionally, but there was a long time that I couldn't drink. But I had to change everything. I had to change my career. I moved to another city. I wow. disconnected from my friends. And then I was mentally dead for a long time. And then one day, the spark came back. Because mentally, I thought that I couldn't create anything unless I was high. You seem to have stopped drinking and automatically just, boom, <laughs> Matt's coming in high. <laughs> Is that to keep yourself busy or did your creative juices just start flowing? And I ask because people that know me from before see what I'm doing now and they're like, dude, what's up with you? And I'm like, it's amazing how much you can accomplish when you're fucking sober. You yeah. know what I mean? So my yeah, question think, uh... is, are you just trying to keep busy? Or are you just, is it just like, it's flowing through you right now, creativity? Well, Jesse lovingly refers to me as the madman. Yeah. Um, and he knows that, like, come rain or shine, I'm out there doing it every day, no matter what the occasion or the weather. So I think really it's just now I don't have hangovers slowing me down. I'm like the madman times a thousand. That's yeah. really all it is. Like the the ideas and the um the hunger was always there and has always been there. But I'm usually like diluting that with heavy partying. Right. So um yeah, right. I still want to achieve and do all these things, but I don't necessarily do so because I'm like hanging. <laughs> yeah. Um whereas yeah. now I don't have hangovers, so I'm like, yeah, let's get to work. <laughs> I wish I would have stopped. 30 shit i would have wish i would have never stopped i wish i would have never started but whatever some of it was fun looking in, back in high yeah but, so yeah. The, the beginning um <clears throat> grew up uh with my mom my dad wasn't very connected with us we grew up very poor new york city new jersey in the 70s was a nightmare um i had a rough childhood but i was in a loving home um music was a big deal to me coming up. I mean, I remember the day that I discovered that music was helping me. I was, so we lived in a building when I was seven, eight years old in 1970s, New Jersey. And our neighborhood was in the winter time, the, what they used to call the bums or homeless people and drug addicts would break into our building just to get warm. So there was that type of thing happening. There was gangs. There was a building across the street that burned down. I lived alone with my mom. I was just like a chubby little kid. I never felt safe. And at night, I would be so scared to go to sleep at night. And my mom wouldn't let me sleep in the bed with her, which is what I wanted. And I had this little Superman transistor radio. And one night I took it in the bed with me. And, you know, I, I had barely had the volume up. So as a matter of fact, 
Dude, it's so vivid to me. I put it under my pillow just in case my mom came in the room. She wouldn't see it. And Wolf, Wolfman Jack. Have you ever guys ever heard of Wolfman oh, Jack? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude, it, Wolfman's Jack. Yeah, Wolfman Jack. Yeah, hey, baby. Woo, it's Wolfman. And his voice came through there. And I was like, what am I listening to? And um, immediate, and he was, you know, his show was all 50s rock and roll. So here it is, 1976. I'm listening to Wolfman Jack secretly every single night. I'm the only kid in my neighborhood that's into like Elvis. Everyone else is into John ah. Travolta. I'm going to school with my hair slicked back. My mom doesn't know what's wrong with me. But that was comforting to me. And I, that music has been comforting to me my entire life. Um, <clears throat> we moved around a lot. Um, and I had a rough childhood. Let's just, we'll, we'll just say that. Everyone's had it rough. I, I had it rough too which is, I think, why I have such a soft spot for, for kids. And I don't think that any children should suffer or be uncomfortable or, or, uh, or have any type of hardships. Uh, when I was a teenager, I discovered, I asked for a guitar. I was on a guitar, started playing guitar, and that was the next thing that I was really into. I mean, I had such, I was obsessed with it, you know, and you guys probably, I'm sure, know what that's like obsessed with playing the guitar my parents hated it my mother hated it by then she was remarried my stepfather he didn't get it they were like what you know at that time it was like hair metal so i wanted to grow my hair out i'd ripped up jeans um and one day they just took it away from me i didn't have good grades dude i was fucking crushed it was like my world ended like it was the only thing that i really loved in this world was that it was the only thing that i was ever good at like, I took three guitar lessons. And that was a fucking nightmare. Then one day I meet another kid at school that looked like me, long hair, had Van Halen scratched on his notebook. I'm like, he's obviously cool. And he taught me a power chord. <laughs> Dude, the following week, I had learned like every single song on the Judas Priest album that I had, every single Scorpion song. It was like, wow, I can play every song. I mean, I was Iron Maiden. The next thing you know, I'm teaching my friends how to play guitar. So I was that passionate, passionate when they, when she took it away, when my parents took away my guitar, it was like a kite and they cut the string and it was just like, I was just fucking lost. You know what I mean? I just gave up after that. Um, and just my life was just a weird, I got to be part of a lot of really cool music communities between 1983 and the present all by mistake. So during that loss, I stopped playing music. Um, I rolled into the eighties uh, punk scene in Atlanta where I discovered the Ramones and that was another life changing thing. And we followed the Ramones around like, like they were the fucking grateful dead. Um, but better. But better, <laughs> but better. Ex but, well, ex uh, except for Johnny, was always a dick to us. But Joey, who was like an angel from heaven, and Dee Dee was always just trying to get us to go cop drugs for him. But <clears throat> that's another story. Rest that's in peace. Amazing. Um, How did yeah. you get down to Atlanta? What what, what brought so you? So we moved around a lot, and I ended up going to high school in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, by the time I was eighteen, I was orphaned, um, so I was on my own. And then that's when I started hitchhiking and all that stuff. So I, in Atlanta, I got to experience the punk scene. There was like an industrial dance scene, which was like its own crazy thing in the 80s, where it was like punk, but dance, but really aggro. And there was a, 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 a underground gay music house scene was just developing there. And I loved the music, man. And I was just soaking it all in. But my thing growing up was that I didn't want to just experience it. Like, I wanted to be in it. You know what I mean? Ended up through those travels in Chapel Hill when the grunge thing started breaking. Chapel Hill had a really great grunge scene. It was a place just where every band would stop. So, for example, I weaseled my way into working at the Cat's Cradle, um, doing, like, uh, doing, uh, doing the, the stage security there and met bands like Soundgarden and all those guys way before they blew up you know what i mean like loud love uh yeah. that concert tour 
I'll tell you a funny story. I was running across. They were the 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 man. Our manager said they don't want anybody on the stage. They're really fucking picky about people stage diving. Cat's Cradle was notorious for fucking just hardcore slam dancing at that time. So to make a long story short, they were playing their last song, Big Bottom by Spinal Tap. <laughs> fucking, yeah, dude, it was awesome. Chris Cornell's playing the guitar, which was the only song that he played guitar on. I'm running across the stage ducking because one of my friends was doing security on the other side. Who weighed, I don't even know why they had us doing security. He weighed like 90 pounds and I weighed 125. Um, I, he got pulled into the audience. And I was running across and all of a sudden I feel like what, like a fucking gunshot hit me in the back and I get knocked into the audience and I pull myself back up and I'm like, what the fuck is happening? I turn around and Chris Cornell is trashing the fucking stage. I mean, he's got the microphone and he's fucking throwing it in the air through the ceiling tiles, bottle of water, just ah, he's having a fucking tamper tantrum <laughs> runs off the stage. I'm like, what the fuck is this problem? They're like, dude, you kick the microphone stand down in the middle of this song. Oh, geez. I'm like, oh my god, that was that was my favorite band at that time. So it was like knocking the microphone out of God's hand, right? <laughs> so we get backstage, and I'm, you know, me and all my little homies. I mean, we idolized, uh, you know, Nirvana when it was like Bleach, like it was at that time. Like Nirvana hadn't had come out with their big albums. Like there was no word for grunge. It was like Mother Love Bone and all those bands, all those Seattle bands. So we're backstage and they're like, the, their manager comes out. He's like, the band wants to talk to you on the bus. And I'm like, oh my God, they're going to fuck me up. <laughs> they're going to beat me up. I was like, I don't want to go on the bus. I'm like, dude, I grab my best friend. I'm like, please go on the bus with me because I don't, I think they're going to beat me up. You saw how he trashed the stage, right? So I went on the bus and he apologized and he's like, I'm really sorry. Just you fucked the song up for me. And he, they gave us beers and shirts from the show. And of course we were like, yeah. That's awesome. Anyway, that was I just totally went on a tangent. On oh, I love it. I, I, else. I'm seeing Apologize. it all in my head, dude. That's what a time frame for music, too. Yeah. So, so did that. Uh, got into the hip hop. I saw Public Enemy, and that was another there at the Cat's Cradle, in a, in a venue that there was probably 200 people in. And Public Enemy, I don't know if you know about them, but it was. It takes a nation of millions. They had oh, yeah. the S1Ws, the Nation of Islam. They had all these freaking guys in tuxedos in the front because once they were ready for us to slam dance, it's all white kids there, you know? Um, and, and, and so that concert changed, just blew my mind. It was like a new form of punk rock to me, you know? I'm like, the, so I fell in love with it so much that I learned how to DJ, started DJing. And then was a hip hop DJ for 15 years, moved to South Beach, um, did that as a career, um, got into acid jazz, the acid jazz movement, Jamiroquai, and all that stuff was happening, started promoting, promoting parties there, worked also in the, in, in the gay um, house music scene there, which was super progressive at the time. So it's been a crazy journey. Um, Are you partying like, throughout all those years? Yeah. Dude, like a, yeah, like a, uh, you like I would say like a rock star, but you know, like a dumbass at the same time. <laughs> I had so many opportunities that I destroyed. So in that time period, I was, and I always I say now, and I don't know how you feel about God or anything, but to have that gift of of being creative you're an artist or a writer or a musician to me those are gifts that god gives you because if you think about it the only being that can create something out of nothing is god you know what i mean so i mean god had a blank canvas and he made this world right so if it, it, my son when he was younger when uh, god rest his soul i would tell him all the time he was a visual artist and he would take a pile of garbage and come home and and he would make something. And I'm like, you don't understand that gift that you have. I don't have that. Like, how could you take something and make something beautiful out of nothing? I, you know, that God gives you that. And I, and I have a quick theory that I'm going to share with you. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you take all the writers in the world, all the artists in the world, all the musicians in the world, and all the people that we call like 
creatives now and you bunch them all, all together, what percentage of those people would you say deal with some type of depression? <laughs> a large one. Yeah. The vast majority, I would say. Yes. Uh, oh, you just hit mute, dude. Did I mute myself? What yeah, happened? there you go. Yeah, you're you, good now. Your, wis your wisdom was cut so deep, you had to silence <laughs> yourself. <laughs> Are you back? Hey. Talk. Can you hear us? Oh, you're muted. Is yeah, you just you just got to turn the uh, the the mute button back off. Bottom left, see the microphone. Just hit. There we go. So are like, we good? Yes. yes, I can hear myself. There Did we go. God can just you guys hear me? You? Yes, I can't hear you. You can't hear us now. <laughs> Ghost in the machine, dude. Right. At such a weird point. One, two, three, four. Yeah, 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 yeah. You might want to. Um, I can't hear you guys at all. You can't, I was going to say you might want to restart your mic setup, but if you can't hear us, that would be pointless. Can you sign with me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Try pulling your mic in and out, like reconfiguring your mic in some way. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Okay. Yeah. And so, we're back. Yes. So my, my question was, uh, so you take that group of yeah, hundreds, yeah. 100 of those people. How Large. many of those are dealing with depression? Large. My theory is this. So as human beings, God gave us like this tiny sliver of what he has inside him. And it is so powerful that we cannot handle it. We go it's, mad. The compulsion is so great that you go mad unless you know how to use it. You know what I mean? And it wasn't until after I was older that I realized that. <clears throat> and I used to say as a joke when I was DJing. When people would be like, oh, my God, that's amazing. And I would say, it's God touching my head right now. Because I was so high, that's just some stupid shit that I said. But when now when I look back at my life and I can see periods where I played in a band and success with that band was coming so easily, and then I would flush it down the toilet. I thought I was flushing it down the toilet, but it was literally just taken away from me. And I, that project was done. And then I would work on something else and it would go up really fast. And it would be taken away from me. And with DJing, it was like I was given so many gifts and so many chances to do something beyond. But I was so high that I didn't under, like, you know, MTV came and, and offered me things and all different kinds of people. And I would, you know, I, I didn't care about it. I just in my mind, I was like, I'm an artist and, you know. I'm not going to corrupt those things and all those things you tell yourself when you're either young or high, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, um, like I said, there was, there's music projects and, you know, uh, just all, you know, I looking back on it now, I'm okay with it because I learned something from all those things. And I learned something from being a drug addict and, from hitchhiking and from sleeping under bridges and from hopping on trains and just the people that I met. Um, you learn something from all of that. And for a long time, my wife would tell me, I don't know how you have survived this long because, you know, there's been gunshots and drug overdoses and pipe bombs thrown at us and the insanity of, of even being homeless, you know what I mean? Or being a teenage hitchhiker. That she's like, you obviously, you were God was hanging on to you for a purpose. And a lot, I used to joke with her, I'm like, I have all these skills, right? But none of them are any good at making money. <laughs> I'm like, I wish that I could just take my skills and, and do something that would, that would help financially. And for a long time, that was the running joke. But when Amigo Skate Cuba started, I realized that all of those bad things that I went through, and all of those skills that I jokingly say were worthless are what make that are what make Amigo Skate Cuba work. You know what I mean? And it's that that attracts people to it. You know, our thing with Amigo Skate Cuba is, and what we do is we try to go. Our mission was never just to stay in Cuba, but it's just where we have stayed. Um, and just to give the listeners a little background there, Cuba is a communist country. Things like creativity are stifled by the government um, to the point where 
children call themselves zombies because they are told not to be creative. You, you're, you're not allowed to think freely. You're not allowed to dream. You know what I mean? Um, so what we try to do with Amigo is just create that spark in kids that are, these kids are, are dead to the world. I mean, they literally call themselves zombies. They, there's a, there was a group of them that used to call themselves no futures. Um, and, and they have every right to, I mean, they live they, they literally live in a world and I'll give you both an example right now. When you were 14 years old, Jesse, and I kind of already know the story because I also listened to a bunch of the podcasts. What, what was the thing that turned you on? What was the thing that you were like, fuck, man, I love that. What is that? Yeah, hardcore punk music. Absolutely. I just knew I was going to hold a microphone and, and, and do it. And uh, you couldn't tell me no on that. But, you know, what, I had encouragement. What was, it, no. what was it, though, that drew you to that? Because you saw shows, because you were... Yeah, I had access to it through a community of people. Absolutely. I went to shows. I saw VHS tapes. We traded tapes. Like I had a community that drew right. me into that. Yeah. Okay, you can't have any of those things. So put that on pause. Matt, 14 years old. Women. Women. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was it was very much for me. I've never skateboarded, but like the culture of skating for me has always been hand in hand with punk rock. And it's about identity and it's about expression. It's about freedom. It's about family. Um, you know, it's about giving people who don't have a life something to latch onto and as you say, to dream and to hope and live for. Um, but in the West, we take those things for granted, don't we? We have them yep. right there. We can go so, to shows. We can go to <clears throat> parks. Everything you guys mentioned is illegal in Cuba. Yeah. So you're not going to punk shows. You're not going to be part of that community because it's against the law for that community to exist. You can't be part of the skateboarding community because it, that community is not allowed to exist to the point to where there are no skate shops in Cuba because it's illegal to have a skate shop. And there's no music store to even buy a microphone or a guitar or a set of drums because that's illegal too. So yeah. where does that end? For me at that age, it was, it, was, it was rock and roll and skateboarding and BMX and wanting to be part of those communities because probably much like you guys, it was a community that I had something in common with. We were like the outsiders. I wasn't into you know, team sports. I was, you know what I mean? I, that's what turned me on. So the three of us now, 14 years old in Cuba, we're fucked. What are you going to do? We're going to drink, right? Mm, what yeah. else are we doing? I'm fucking unhappy. I can't, I can't skateboard. You know, we can't listen. We can't go see a show. When we first started in Cuba, going to Cuba in 2010, they didn't have inter access to the internet. So it's not like you could go on YouTube and find those things. You'd have to wait for some drunk tourist to like accidentally leave you like a hardcore CD. You know what I mean? So what do we do? See, our community, that's what we're good at. There was a lot, there's a lot of people that look at Amigo and their complaint is with so many other hardships in Cuba, why would you waste your time, you know, with, bringing skateboards down or bringing a camera down or bringing, uh, you know, a guitar down. We have a buddy that, that works for Fender. So he hooks us up with guitars. I and feel like very quickly, I feel like that's um, an attack, which a lot of charitable organizations get, no matter what it is. There's one in the UK that gives haircuts to homeless people. And it's, it. a, and it's a similar sort of thing. People are like, well, they need homes more than they need haircuts. And you're like, well, yeah, they do. But what can you get them today that's a lot easier? And when you give someone a haircut, you give them a sense of like, they, they feel decent about themselves, like they're a human being, like they have self-worth. Um and so you can start with things like haircuts and skateboards and that can change someone's soul, can't it? You know, you're not going to change the world overnight, but you can start with these things like that. And I, yeah, I do feel like that's a very easy criticism to make that a lot of charitable organizations face, but fuck that shit. I mean, a lot, it, I, over the years, I've realized that the people that make those comments are people that don't do anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course. What makes this powerful and what, it's, what I try to tell everyone, 
because there's a lot of people like I want to go down there and do something. And I'm like, you don't even have to come with me. What are you into? And that's what you're going to do. That's what makes that's what makes this powerful. That's what makes this conversation powerful. The government's not coming to save anybody over there or over here. But it's us guys. You know what I mean? That have experience, have life experience. They can actually go out there and change lives. You understand what I'm saying? With me, the only thing that I could do to help, I have access to skateboards. I have access to people's old music equipment. I have access to dope photographers that can go down there and teach photography. I have access to graffiti artists, just like you guys. I mean, we're in the same, even though we just met, our communities are probably very similar. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's a way to help. And it's been 10 years. And even though those things might seem silly to some people, but I'll give you quick examples. 10 years ago, there was a kid that wanted to learn photography. We got National Geographic photographer to go down there and take him a camera and teach him how to take pictures. And we kept bringing that guy down and kept working with him and taught him how to, how to apprentice, how to be a location scout, how to take pictures, how to develop film. He's an adult now, and he's now an established photographer working. You know what I mean? Amazing. The kids that we helped with graffiti are now leading the charge in that whole creative rebellion that's happening right in, in Havana within the graffiti world. The kid who wanted to ride a skateboard 10 years ago is now getting approached by the barracks. You know what I mean? Has American companies trying to figure out how to sponsor him, even though it's impossible to get him the equipment. But these things were impossible 10 years ago. And we made the impossible possible. You know what I mean? I got to bring up I got to bring up the documentary because I keep seeing an image in my head and I have to talk about it because it really struck me uh, with everything. I wasn't, I wasn't wearing a wig, was I? No, no. no. Oh, that was with a different it, that was a different movie. I'm sorry. <laughs> with everything <laughs> that you're talking about here, um, <clears throat> there was a shot of kids having a competition skateboarding in the rain um, oh, yeah. oh, and awesome. there were scenes where you're seeing just pure joy of kids being able to be kids and that yeah. kind of that kind of got me teary-eyed because i was thinking about that those moments that we, i've taken for granted as a kid those, those moments of pure joy where you're there with your friends you're surrounded by people and you're sharing a common love for something and you know, even though it was a competition, it, the the spirit of that had nothing to do really with the competition. Right. It's just about these kids just doing this thing. It's such a beautiful that whole documentary is awesome to watch, but that Thank one you. got me, and I was sitting there in tears, like, "Wow, this is." It, some- I've been in. I've yeah. been. Thank you, and I've been brought to tears. As a matter of fact, we used to <laughs> we used to have this thing where my wife and I. Um, where we would be like the bigger and the burlier and the gnarlier the dude is that we take to Cuba with us, the more he's going to cry on the plane on the way home. Hmm. I've seen it a hundred times. And we take, fucking, you know, gnarly, just beer drinking, DIY spot concrete. These guys are just in concrete. They're freaking tough and they, <laughs> they smell bad. And you know what I mean? It's, and they're crying, boohoo crying on the plane on the way home because what people don't realize is Cuba is a prison. The entire island is a prison. Commu- uh, you're not allowed to have any community that's outside of the communist community. So everything that we do there is illegal. When we got there, the kids, every, so I'll give you quick examples. We, you'd be on the street. We'd be hanging out skating. You'd meet some kid. and You'd be like, well, what are you into? Um, no, nothing, man. Nothing. No, man. What do you like? I mean. Uh, well, you know, I've, I, it'd be, I like to paint. I like to draw. I like to draw. I wish I could paint, but, um, you know, it's a waste of time. And I'm like, why? He's like, well, because even if you were good at it, you could never have like an art show or anything. Why not? Because the government's, the galleries are run by the government. And I'm, you know, and you'd be like, well, is there, are there any of your friends? He's like, yeah, I've got other friends that want to do it. I'm like, all right, I'll tell you what, next time I come, I'll, I'll bring you some some 
paint supplies. So you'd bring in the paint supplies and damn, some of the kids got some talent, right? Well, why don't we do a, an art show? No, no, you can't do that, man. That's illegal. Well, shit, we could do an art show. No, you can't. I'm like, all right, I'll do the art show. And if we get in trouble, I'll get in trouble. So we do like we do here in the States, man. You'll do an art show at a, at a bar. You know what I mean? We'll do wherever we can get a space. So we would do these events and they would be like the spark. Boom. Oh my God. We could do that. I'm like, yeah, you guys can do it. As a matter of fact, the next time you guys are going to plan it, you tell me what you need and I'll bring the stuff. You guys are going to plan it. You guys figure out how to do it and I'll support it. Next thing you know, they're doing their own art shows. The same thing's happening with the kids that are doing photography. Skateboard contests, dude, that's 100% illegal. You're not allowed to have a skateboard contest. Zero. Well, we're going to have one. I'm going to have one. So you guys want to participate? Do you want to have a skateboard contest or not? No, Renee, you can't do that. The cops are going to come. Well, I don't want to say fuck the police. But, <laughs> you know, by the time they get here, we'll be done, dude. So we started doing contests. The next thing you know, and I'm not saying that I'm trying to rabble rouse, but these kids are getting bolder and realizing that they can do things. You know what I mean? Do um, you guys know what Go Skateboarding Day is? It's a, it's a yearly event, June 21st, all over the world. And what you do is skateboard communities get together and they skate kind of like critical mass, bicycle style through the streets. Some of the bigger cities will have events. But mainly, you get all your skaters together and you skate through the streets. After being in Cuba for five years, I was like, why don't you guys do a go skateboarding? They were like, fuck, you can't do that. That's like having a parade. They will come and they'll beat us all up. Police, they'll take us to jail. All right, we're doing it. <laughs> <clears throat> so I organized it. <clears throat> like 75 of us. Um, <clears throat> We had an American flag and a Cuban flag. This is before John Kerry came and put the American flag at the embassy again with the Marines six years ago. So we actually flew the flag in Cuba, the American flag before them. But so we did it. We had our own skateboarding day celebration. And as we're skating that, when we first started skating, I'm praying, dear Jesus, <laughs> don't let anybody get hurt. Because I am also thinking, this, you know, could get ugly. So we're skating. And what I, looking back on it, I realized, number one, we're all skating full speed because you have so much adrenaline and you're freaking out. So we're <laughs> skating, skating. And all of a sudden, I'm the oldest guy and I'm getting tired, but the younger kids are coming <laughs> up to me, right? They're, so all of a sudden, it's like I was in the front with the flag, right? All of a sudden, like the group is coming and they're all going, it, we're doing it. We're doing it. And kids are crying, dude. Fucking crying. Because you're not allowed to do anything together. You're not allowed to have self-pride. You know what I mean? You're not allowed to gather any groups on your own. Dude, they, so many kids cried. So many kids were like, we can't believe this is happening. It, made, it was like Christmas for everyone that year. We continued it on for five years eventually. Kids were coming from the whole island, getting on buses, hitchhiking, whatever. Then the government started realizing what we were doing and started harassing us and threatening to um, threatening um, threatening us and, and things like that. So we had to pause it for one year. But the point is that all those things that people find silly are not silly because it's emboldened those kids in Havana. You know what I mean? It's taught them that they can take charge of their lives, that they can, they're allowed to have dreams and they're allowed to act on those dreams because they're not hurting anybody. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? You're not hurting anybody, uh, Jesse, by picking up a guitar and playing it. You know what I mean? Matt, it, you know, it's like to be an artist and not have a paintbrush and not be able to express yourself on a canvas. Dude, it's crushing. You know what I mean? So that's what we want to do. And that's what we've been doing for 10 years. And it's been a fucking struggle. You know what I mean? But I've seen firsthand what something like skateboarding, like for my son, for example, my oldest son, 
who always felt like he was too small and he was always kind of on the bottom and on the outs of everything. The day he started skating, his whole world changed. His persona changed. His attitude changed. All of a sudden, he's part of a community. All of a sudden, he's not this grindy kid that's not getting picked for anything because he is excelling at this thing. You know what I mean? So much so that he's more focused than, a, than, an, than an athlete on a team because he has to coach himself because that's what you do in skateboarding. You know what I mean? You don't have a coach on you. Give me 20 ollies in a row. Jump, jump. No. <coughs> You're fucking doing it. You're going to do 120 fucking ollies until you land that first one. And what happens when you land that first one, even though it was ugly as hell, all of your homeboys are going to cheer you on. Mm. You know what I mean? Well, that's I mean, the cool be- thing about skating, yeah, is you keep picking yourself up, you know, because nobody gets to learn those most kind of desirable tricks without failing a thousand times. And that's why the kind of mentality of that sport is so inspirational is because it's about self-improvement, isn't it? It's core Um, and creativity as well. Like skateboarders see the world differently. I think like you walk down a street with a skateboarder and they don't see like a bench and a ledge and a curb. They see a potential route and a way of like, you know, turning the world into their canvas it's amazing what you're it's doing is amazing creative. dude as well thank it's you. so killer thank you man thank you i appreciate that yeah the way it's the way a skateboarder sees the landscape for the average person doesn't understand it because you only think of skateboarding as just pushing it down the street but you're looking at obstacles in a way that's so creative that the average person unless you do that you don't get it you know what i mean you don't get it because you're just looking at a broken piece of concrete and this kid's looking at it like it's a launch ramp. You know what I mean? So skating is, is, is a strange thing, you know, and there's a reason why skateboarding music and art have always from day one have been so intertwined. You know what I mean? They're, they're all hyper creative, hyper rebellious. Um, well, it's not competitive either, is it? That's the thing I love about skateboarding. You, you sort of touched on it there. Is in team sports, you're pitched against others and you're yeah. trying to better the fellow human being and excel yeah. above them. In skateboarding, you're only trying to excel above your, you know, yourself, and you're trying to just improve and raise your own game. You know, there yeah. isn't that competitive element. It's just pure. It's more about joy and expression. Yeah, yeah. No, it is. Um... Yeah, skateboarding is just, the average person doesn't get it. There's no way that, that you could understand it because you're not even looking at the obstacles in the street the same way. You know what I mean? I think, and here's the thing, it's not that the skateboard is not transformative. I, I say this all the time. The skateboard is just wood, tr- you know, piece of metal, some plastic wheels. It's fucking dead. You know what I mean? It's what you do with that skateboard. That, that brings you life. You know what I mean? You, 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 can, you can train with it. You can, you can it, it's transportation. It gives you part, it, it, it literally is the key to a community. You know what I mean? I mean, everywhere you go, and no matter what city you're in, you have your skateboard, you'll find some skaters and you are part of a community. You know what I mean? That's, I think, what the Cuban government doesn't like is that these guys are a community. The, 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 the punk rock kids are part of a community. The, the, the graffiti guys are part of a community. All the artists are part of a community. What scares the shit out of them is that they don't want... Let's just talk about Havana, right? Let's say that, that all those people that I mentioned <clears throat> make up 500 young men and women under the age of 25 years old, right? 500 men and women under 25 years old. It took, it took under 30 people to start the Cuban revolution, it took less than 30 young men to essentially take over that ice, to start, spark the stoke and start that revolution. So to know that there's 500 young men and women that are doing their own thing in Havana scares the shit out of the Cuban government. And that's why, you know, when I tell people that, that we're being threatened by them, you know what I mean? That they're taking kids into the police station 
and interrogating them and asking them about me and asking them about Amigo Skate Cuba, people were like, you're full of shit. I'm like, I'm not full of shit. They're scared. They're scared because they don't want those kids being together. They don't want anybody grouping up. Mm-hmm. You know, it's illegal. They don't want, for the same reason that they didn't want churches and they got rid of the churches during the revolution, that's why they don't allow the artists to, you know, this, these last riots were, were started by a group of artists. It's dangerous for them. So I have a question. Why Cuba? You, you have such conviction, <clears> such <throat> passion for it. And uh, clearly the mission needs to be, you know, extended there. But what brought you to Cuba initially? Where, where did that even enter your mind? Like, oh, let's go do this crazy thing. Because on paper, it's crazy to go to a country like that and try to spread, you know, an extreme sport. You know, <laughs> how did that happen? Uh, <laughs> so my parents <clears throat> both came from Cuba uh, right at the start of the revolution, but <clears throat> I had no desire to ever go there. I never thought I was going to go there. My, my oldest son, uh, Kaya, when he was 15, um, we used to take all these, we, as my kids and I would take family trips and it would be like, we used to call them the, the epic skate adventures. So we go camping and, and skateboarding and all those things at the same time. And one day it was, the weather was bad in Miami, which meant that him and all his friends were inside the house, probably skating inside the house. And I was like, dude, leave me alone. Why don't you guys, why don't you find some place to go for your, uh, for your senior trip? I'm, Cause I said, when you graduate from high school, I'll send you wherever you want to go on a skate trip. Thinking that he's going to pick like England or somewhere. So dude, like half an hour later, he comes barging into my room. Poppy, because that's what he called me. <laughs> He's like, Poppy, I know where I want to go. Where do you want to go? Cuba. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? They don't, there's no, do they, are there skate parks in Cuba? I don't know anything about it. I'm disconnected from Cuba. Like, I literally don't know anything about it at that point. <clears throat> and he's like, well, I found a documentary about these skaters in Cuba and how they don't have any equipment and how they're constantly being beat down. And I want to go down there because at that time um, I was managing a skate park, a nonprofit skate park in Miami. And my son and I and my kids were already kind of doing a little work with the neighborhood kids where we would get people to give us their old equipment and we would refurbish it. Our house was kind of on the dividing line between the good side of the tracks and the bad side of the tracks. The skate park was on the good side of the tracks. So we wanted all the kids from the wrong side of the tracks to hang out at my house to keep them out of trouble. So those kids already knew to come to my house and I'd repair their skateboards or give them skateboards or whatever. So we already had that kind of vibe going. And so my son says, I want to go to Cuba and I want to take the skateboards. And I'm like, dude, there's, there's no way you can even go. This is before Obama changed the rules to fly there. I'm like, there's no way we can go please, Poppy, please, please, please. I'm like, all right, well, let me talk. <clears throat> let me talk to mommy because she's really the brains of the outfit. I <laughs> like most wives. I'm like, if she can figure out how to get us there, then we'll do it. So she comes back to me and it's, it's really difficult. It's really expensive. And on top of that, it's illegal to go there. And I'm like, dude, I don't know what to tell you. And he's like, please, I will. I'll make a deal with you. You don't have to give me any Christmas presents this year if you'll just take me there. And um, <clears throat> I mean, what was I supposed to say? You know, that was like the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard. And at, so his, we went, at, his, at his age, too, at to 15 years old, have man. that desire to give to others on top of just wanting to go there. Yeah, that's pretty profound. Yeah. It was. So we so we we did it. We actually went Well, four of us went. Um illegally we had we had papers that we had forged not really forged paper we had papers from a church saying that we were going on a on a mission trip with it from a church and then we had some other documents saying that we were doing something else all of it was fake but to make a long story short we got to cuba and then he pulled the all my son kaya his just the most beautiful soul ever so we're there First day we get there and they're like, we want to go outside and look for the skaters. And I'm like, all right, cool. We'll unpack. 
he find they find the skaters immediately and we go out and we, we hang out with them and immediately it's i'm like oh my god this is the most beautiful experience ever all these kids showed up with their skateboards and instantly just making friends and at one point a couple hours go by and i'm already exhausted and my wife and i want to go eat and he's like we want to leave him and my, our friend Shane, we want to go leave and, and skate some spots with these kids. And I'm like, go. So I don't see him until that night. When he gets home, I look at his feet and I'm like, I just bought him a brand new pair of Vans. And I'm like, dude, where are your shoes? Where did you get those fucked up <laughs> kicks that you're wearing? And he's like, oh man. Um, he's like, all right, don't get mad at me, but I gave him away. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, and I was felt like such an ass. And so I'm like, are you? And I yelled at him. I'm like, are you kidding? I just bought those sneakers for this trip. Why would you do that? That was so stupid. If you want to give them away, maybe wait till the end. Of the, and just, blah, 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 and I went on and on and on. And he just put his head down and walked away. And the next day I woke up and I'm like, oh, I'm such an idiot. I'm such an idiot. I'm like, he literally took the shoes off of his feet and gave them to somebody else and put on that kid's stinky, holy shoes. I mean, who does that? So I later, I apologized. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, what you just did is what this mission will be about from now on. And from that day forward, it was a known thing that whoever was going, I would tell people, it is a contest to see who can come home with the least amount of shit. So if you come back and you only have the clothes on your back, then it was a successful trip for you. And that's the way we did it. And it would be the type of thing where you'd be getting ready to get on the taxi home and you'd see guys taking off their sneakers, shirts off their backs and just throwing them, you know, like they made friends with somebody. And it, I mean, <clears throat> I get choked up thinking about it because that's when I was telling you about seeing those big burly guys cry all the time. That would be, um, <clears throat> that would be when it would happen. You know what I mean? And uh, unfortunately, my son passed away since then, but his, his and not even knowing that this was happening, you know what I mean? But that was his spirit coming through this project, watching guys, watching skaters. You talk about 20 year old skaters that are saving their money to go to Cuba, spending money that they don't have, taking a bus for 42 hours from New York City to go give away skateboards in Cuba. Um, it's beautiful. You know what I mean? Like these guys don't have anything to begin with and they're giving it all away. Fuck it, dude. I'll figure it out when I get back to New York. I mean, it's like, how beautiful is that? You never see that. You know what I mean? Like you're literally giving the shirt off. It's one thing to write a check. Yeah. You know, here's a thousand dollars. Thank you. I appreciate that. Dude. But when you're giving me something that belongs to you, you know what I mean? I mean, that's that's what it's all about. Well, that's what transforms lives, right? There. Yeah, you were talking about God's work earlier. I think that's it right there. That's God's yeah. work right there. That generosity, that unselfish generosity, that's God's work. And the fact that your son's spirit is still in there, that's a powerful testament to the life he lived and the life that he's the lives he's affected through that. And you know, you could see yourself as a father to some of those kids over in Cuba because of oh yeah, you know, and that's that's huge because it's much bigger than skateboarding. It's much bigger than punk rock, even though that spirit is through and through yeah. present to that. But you know, I got to circle it back. Being the son of a preacher, man, you're doing God's work. Period. Right there. That's what I think too, man. I mean, I don't, you know, like I, it's funny because I would always. People would think I was kidding because I have, you know, I do joke around a lot, but I'd be like, I'm on a mission from God and I don't preach while I'm there. You know what I mean? But I am on a mission from God. I feel like we are, we are the same character as the disciples, as all the people that Jesus hung out with. Cause he didn't hang out with that upper crust people. He hung out with the street people, man. You know what I mean? He hung out with, us you know what i mean and like i said i feel that we are the ones that are making changes you know i'm looking at all the people that you guys interview and i see like a common thread you know the the 
punk rock and paintbrushes, um, you know, everything that Michael Lego's been through. I mean, there's a, it's like, it's a commonality of people who are, who were broken. You know what I mean? And fought through that. And now they're like, fuck it, man. I got, I'm, I got to help you. I got to help that guy. And I know how to fix that. Like, I don't know how to do anything, dude. You know what I mean? I don't know how to do anything, but I know how to help that kid. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not good at anything else. I'll be honest with you. I can't balance a checkbook. I suck at everything on the computer, obviously, as, as you've witnessed. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I know, I, I, I know how to hustle a skateboard off of a skateboard company. You know what I mean? I know how to, I know how to smuggle a skateboard into Cuba because that shit's illegal. So you got to smuggle it in like you're a fucking drug dealer. You know what I mean? I know how to double talk airport security in Havana so they don't steal all the friggin' tattoo equipment that I have hidden in my bag. You know what I mean? Or the fact that I have 13,000 tattoo needles in a fucking duffel bag and they want to know why. You know what I mean? So I like those skills that were good on the street. God is using that for something. You know what I mean? Just to give hope to the hopeless. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful thing, man. And now 10 years later, those kids are parents now. You know what I mean? Like, I always felt like there's never a good feeling at any, at the end of any of those mission trips for me because I was never able to help everybody. So when I come home, I feel like I failed for 10 years. I come home from one of those trips and I don't, if I took, if we took as a group, not me, because, you know, it's not, it's not the Renee show. I mean, we're, we're a group of friends. <laughs> <clears throat> there's been times when we have taken 300 skateboards to Cuba and I've come home and been depressed for two weeks. Cause I can only remember the people that didn't get one. Like I never remember the people that I, that I gave it to. So for 10 years, it's been like, dude, I suck at this. I fucking suck at this. Like we don't, you know what I mean? And every once in a while, someone will be like, Hey man, I'm, you know, I have my own kid now and, and, and I'll be honest with you what you did for me, like my dad wouldn't do that for me, but I'm going to make sure I do that for my kid. You know? And that's like the shit that, that keeps me going. Cause as far as I'm concerned, it was a fail. Every time you come back oh, you're like, Fuck. I couldn't give that kid, you know, a skateboard. Hang on one second. Guys, the dog is about is trying to get out. No worries, dude. And that happens in every podcast. Doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. That seems to be something. Wow. Incredible stuff, man. Incredible stuff. He yeah, hit the nail him. on the head as well with the types of guests that we get on. It was never like designed <laughs> to be that way, but it's, it's certainly become that, hasn't it, over time? Hmm. Listen, I, I thank you guys for the pod, the, for what you guys are doing through this podcast. I um, <clears throat> at first I was just going to listen to one or two, just be like, oh, maybe see. I didn't know anything about it. I actually yeah, thought get the vibe. Yeah, well, I thought so. When you wrote me first, I thought he's going to interview me about my music project fucking awesome how did he hear about it uh i'm cool and then i'm like oh no it's not that it's about amigo which is equally cool so i think let me listen to the 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 podcast so i listen to one and then i listen to another and i'm like there's a common theme here and even though everyone that you've interviewed is different in what they do we're all like kind of in the same like made out of the same mold you know I don't really it's know wild isn't it and that's completely by accident or maybe it's yeah. more maybe there's larger things at work now but we certainly never had like a checkpoint of certain characteristics we were looking for in a guest we're obviously drawn towards i guess just similar characters but there is a common thread and it's always like one of the themes that come up are always as you say like adversity and triumph and hope and love yeah. um yeah. and this has been right up there with the best of them dude thank you man I, i'm so stoked to i would actually just like to talk to you guys later on. i just it's so nice to connect with people they, they get it and are the same spirit you know what i mean like i said i'm so impressed with both of you with with, with what you both you guys are doing i mean there's so much hustle happening especially during I mean, these are weird times right now, dude, you know, weird times. And to see that you guys are, are pushing forward and figuring it out. And I love that, dude. It's like, oh, 
here's a roadblock. Well, we'll figure it out. You know what I mean? It's well, please, it's- if you're free, man, please come along on the third. Sunday the third of April. He's in Pennsylvania, Jesse. So he's right. He's right right close by. Hell yeah! Come on by, man. Shit. Yeah, Yeah, I was shoveling snow (laughs) a little while ago. (laughs) So I'll I'll say this, man. I think you know the real recognize real, and it's the it's that spirit that we all were connected to that DIY punk rock, you know, spirit that continues to uh, to propel us forward. And you know, I I know you know deep down inside that you're not a failure i think it's incredible what you've done and anybody listening or watching you got to watch the documentary definitely check out and plug your plug your band as well man i think uh before we let you go you should plug that as well so i <laughs> we'll link it all up as well when i will link it all up thank you very much uh, i started a music project um kind of a dream project that i've had since i was 15 which is to, I've been writing songs the whole time and been in and out of bands. And I realized that I had all this music written and I'm like, you know what, let me walk the walk instead of just talking the talk. And I'm going to uh, do, you know, record my music. Um, so I did. And what it sounds like to me, what I wanted it to sound like was if you took the Ramones, um, uh, Hank Williams, senior, and the Tom Tom Club, and you mix those together in a blender. And that's where the thrift store killers, not because we're killing anybody, because most of my equipment was from the thrift store <laughs> when we started the project. <laughs> um, Love it. And yeah, dude, I'm, it, it feels so nice to, uh, to be recording again and to be, like I said, the creative process, it's, it's a beautiful thing, man. Mm. I'm always telling people, dude, it's not too late. The reason why I'm doing it is because I'm always telling people, it's not too late to start. It's not too late to start. So I'm like, I'll show you. It's not too late to start. I'm going to do it myself. You know, there's walk nothing like creating. That's right, man. Like, you know, got to be like Johnny Cash. <laughs> well, I got to thank you for coming on, man. It was a pleasure. I, I, thank I you, man. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I, in my I research pleasure. on you, it was a really, I was looking forward to this the last time we were supposed to connect. And then I'm, I'm glad it came full circle. And you're able to tell your story and I know you have a lot more to say too. So uh, maybe to be continued and uh, if, yeah, come on down to the live event in New York, man. I would, I would love, love to love to yeah. have you. Man. Yeah. Just email me the, uh, cause I'm going to forget, but I'll, I'll bug you guys. I'll yeah. We'll that. connect on, on the internet as well. I follow you now on Instagram. So for I, guess, sure. I see you. I see you. <laughs> A- any information you want to bring along as well to the live show that can let, you know, our listeners and people who are going to be there know, about the work that you're doing, you know, pamphlets or anything like that. Uh, and obviously just come hang out and meet, meet sure. people and mingle. And it's going to be a beautiful day. And yeah, we'd love to have you. So we'll get you on the list, get you and your wife down and, and we'll hang out and we'll continue this chat in person in New York. Thank you, Thank you guys. I really appreciate you uh, considering me and um, spe- dude, I had a great time. Thank you. you know, bro. Hanging out with you guys. Thank you for all the work that you do as well, man. The world is a better place for you. And, Thank uh, you, guys. You guys as well. Awesome. I'm telling you, this is just the, the tip of the, uh, the iceberg for this podcast. And for the Thank you, brother. Thank you, guys. All right, we'll be in touch, bro. Take care of yourself.